So, did you ever wonder how to move a group of units in Godot? Typically for an RTS game, where you need to control your army on the map? Cause this is actually not that hard to do. Ok, now a little while ago I published this other tutorial, on how to select units in this kind of game. I discussed how to use Raycast to click on a unit, and how to click and drag a selection box across the screen to select multiple units at the same time. In this tutorial, I'm going to build on this first demo, so I'll assume that you already have a unit selection system working, and if you don't have one yet, feel free to go look at that other video, and then come back here. But, so, if you have implemented this kind of selection system, then you should have a simple way to register and unregister units from a list of selected units. In my case, those are units registered by adding them to a node group called Selected Units. So if we create a control node in the scene to take care of unit movement and give it a script, for example one named unit mover, then we can start with this bit of code to check for a right click using the input built-in hook and then iterate through all the selected units that we want to move. Now of course the first question here is where exactly should they move to? And in this tutorial, I'm going to do the very classic thing in RTS of using the right click to pinpoint a destination on the map. So for that, we're actually going to reuse the raycast technique that we discussed in the previous episode on unit selection. And as a quick reminder, in this previous episode, because we wanted to avoid having to do raycasts on each and every selectable unit, when checking for single click selection, we set up an optimized system where we do just one raycast on the water plane of our map, which here is like a ground for ship units. The great thing with that is that, obviously, we can use exactly the same trick to get a movement destination point on this water plane too. So typically, we could reuse the same raycasting function, and this time, when we get a right click, get the matching 3D position on the water plane, and pass it to our units to have them move to that point. Alright, so with that taken care of, it's time to work on the real meat of the code, the move function inside our unit script, the one that we're calling from our movement manager. And before we go any further, it's important that we discuss what our unit scene looks like and in particular, how our movement will not be relying on physics and a character body node. Now, if you're a bit familiar with character movement in Godot, you know that we usually use a character body 3D or character body 2D node for it, and we compute physics-based velocities to displace our avatars. This is the best and easiest way to move a player character in the world while taking into account the rest of the environment and colliders. However, as we discussed last time, RTS games don't usually pose the same questions and goals. Indeed, here, rather than handling collisions with the colliders around our units in a seamless and accurate fashion, what's more important is performance and being able to handle a lot of units. Plus, usually in an RTS, it doesn't matter too much if your units clip with each other while they're moving. All this is why, for an RTS, it can be way better to just do basic translation computations by hand, and use another tool to avoid the units going where they're not supposed to go, as we'll discuss very soon. For now, though, armed with that knowledge that we should avoid physics, for performance sake, we're just going to keep our units prefab scene as is meaning its root node is a node 3D, and it only contains meshes and visuals. We're simply going to reopen the script on said unit root node. So what we're going to do is first, at the bottom, have this move function that is accessed by a unit move script, and that triggers a new move of this unit instance. It receives the 3D point to move to, and stores it as a new target position vector3. Also, let's make sure that our unit faces this target position, and finally, we use this setProcess function to enable our process function. The process function is Godot's update loop function. Whatever you define inside this method will be done continuously as long as the game runs. In our case, this is where we'll slowly update the position of our unit to slide it toward its move target position by computing the difference between the unit's current position and its target position. 
if the unit is still far from it, according to this completely arbitrary threshold, then we'll get the matching normalized direction vector and use it to translate a unit a bit in the proper direction with the given constant speed value. If the unit has reached the target position, then we'll know our move has finished. And of course, we only need to worry about this logic if we've actually triggered a move and if it hasn't finished yet. So to optimize things a bit, I've made sure to disable this process function in two points in the script, when it first starts, in the ready function, and when the unit finishes its current move. This way, this will only run when required. Also note that depending on how you've set up your unit scene, this look at function might give you a slightly unexpected result with your unit turning its back to the target point. To avoid this, just go back to the unit scene, select the model node inside it, and turn it 180 degrees around the y-axis so that it is directed forward. And well, we've already got a super basic movement system in place. If we select some units here and there, and right-click on the water, you see that they indeed slowly slide towards this destination. But as you'll quickly notice, if you select multiple units, this is far from being good enough for us, because all the selected units will go to the same point and just overlap each other, making it impossible to reselect them properly afterwards. Now, a quick and easy solution here can be to just calculate fixed offsets. Basically, if we take a unit from our group of selected units as reference, here I'm using the first one, but you could take any, then we can use its position as reference and offset the target position of every selected unit a little by the current distance between said selected unit and the reference position before the move. If you retry the demo, you'll see that if we select just a single unit, this gives exactly the same result as before, because there isn't any offset, but on the other hand, if we select multiple units, then this extra offset prevents them from overlapping. However, this is really not perfect, because it's pretty hard to anticipate where units will land, apart from the reference one that ends up exactly at the point of the right-click, and even worse, it can quickly lead to units ending up somewhere they shouldn't. For example, in our case, ships should definitely not be half enmeshed in our ground patches. In fact, a very common and better way to solve this overlap issue is to rather use what we call a unit formation. Meaning that when we select a given number of units, we compute positions for each and every one based on an algorithm to place them in a specific shape. Famous and well-featured RTS games like Age of Empires, for example, often offer a large choice of formations and players can actually pick one manually to better organize their armies. Here we'll stay simple and we'll discuss the fundamentals of this technique by focusing on just a single type of unit formation, the line. And actually, as you'll see, it's mostly about creating several lines behind each other to get a little pack of unique positions for selected units. Okay, so let's create a new script in our project, directly from the file browser, because it is going to be purely static, it won't be associated with any node or even node type in particular. And so in GDScript, we can actually have it inherited from the base object type. And then in the script itself, we'll make sure that the GDScript version uses the class name keyword to explicitly name this script class and make it accessible from anywhere else in the project. And the C-sharp version is a simple public static C-sharp class. Then inside, we'll make a function, once again public and static, to compute our line unit formation positions. The idea will be to pass it the reference target position that we want to calculate our positions around, the number of positions to calculate, and some extra options to allow players to customize the formation. Then the function will just fill an array of vector3 positions, as many as the amount of units to place. And so here, the goal will be to make a set of lines of given max length that is centered around the reference position. Feel free to dive in this code if you're curious about how I computed the line formation positions. And of course, if you'd like to learn how to make other kinds of shapes for other kinds of formations, go ahead and tell me down below in the comments. But anyway, for now, we'll just assume that we have this static function in our static unit formations class. 
And so, back in our unit smoother script, we'll replace our offset computations with just a call to this line function with our right clicked position and the amount of selected units as parameters. Finally, all that's left is to assign each formation position to a selected unit. And there we go! With this new system, our units will automatically be placed on lines of 4 units maximum, and then multiple lines, if need be, properly centered around the position of our right click. This is starting to look quite cool, but of course, we still haven't worked out our other issue, the fact that our units can still cross areas that they shouldn't. Like our ships just casually going through our ground, instead of avoiding it. So how exactly can we solve that problem? given that we don't have physical bodies and collisions. Well, a good solution in our case is to rely on a navigation mesh. In a nutshell, a navigation mesh is a tool that allows you to auto-discretize your scene as a thin network of cells to define walkable areas and then easily compute optimized paths on this network to quickly reach a point from a given start position, so kinda exactly what we need here. All right. So to set up a navigation mesh in our scene, we just need to do a few things. Let's start by hiding our units so they don't get in the way while we're working. Now, the elements that we want to consider for navigation mesh are the objects that make up our environment, or in other words, all these four sub-hierarchies in our scene. So we're going to create a new navigation region 3 node, and go to its inspector to create a new resource in its navigation mesh slot before finally dragging our four sub-hierarchies inside it to make them children of our new navigation region 3 node. Then we'll go to the top of the viewport and click this Bake Navigation Mesh button to actually have Godot compute the nav mesh network matching our scene. Okay, so this looks pretty nice, but how exactly does it work? Well, if we inspect the navigation mesh resource we created before and we open up its geometry section, you see that, by default, Godot uses all the meshes in the sub-hierarchies of the navigation region 3 node to know what the scene looks like, and to compute the nav mesh surface. So basically, any flat enough and large enough horizontal surface on the top of those objects will be considered for navigation, and joined as best as possible to the others to create a continuous navigation mesh. You can easily check what navmesh Godot computed, as it's debugged in the viewport with this semi-transparent blue overlay. But of course, this surface depends a lot on the options that you define for your navmesh in your navmesh resource. For example, in our case, our units are pretty large, and they shouldn't be able to go from the water to the land. So let's open the agent section of the navmesh resource and change some settings like this. Here, I've increased the agent radius, that represents the overall size of the units that will move on this nav mesh, and in particular the radius determines the minimum distance to the edges of the surface or the obstacles. I've also reduced as much as possible the climb parameters, so our units aren't allowed to go from the sea to the ground patches. And so after changing those options, if we rebake our nav mesh, you see that the surface is indeed updated, and it looks way better for our use case. It only covers the water and has pretty big holes around islands to mark those zones as non-walkable and prevent our units from trying to go there. Although if you zoom in and go down to the surface of the water, you'll notice that, for now, our nav mesh is sort of floating above it. To snap it back to the proper height, you can open the cells section of the nav mesh resources inspector and reduce its cell height property before rebaking the surface again. Okay, so we now have a nice navigation mesh that we can use to enforce our units, don't try to go in forbidden areas. The next step, of course, is to have our units actually use this navigation mesh to compute optimized paths toward their target position that are properly constrained to the allowed areas. But here, once again, we're going to stray a bit away from the usual route for performance. We won't do the usual of giving each and every unit a navigation agent 3 child node, like I've done in this tutorial, for example, about moving just a single character controller. No, here, instead of having those agents compute their path on their own, we'll use a built-in method from Godot's navigation server 3D API to get those paths from the unit's mover script and pass those computed paths to our units directly. 
In practice, this means that we'll change our move selected units function as follows. Before doing anything, we'll make sure that the target position we right-clicked is actually on the navigation mesh. We'll use our snap to map function, that itself calls the map get closest point utility, to resnap our 3D position to the closest one on the nav mesh. As most of those 3D navigation utilities, the map get closest point function requires that we pass it the navigation map to work on by its resource ID. We can get it once at the beginning of the scene by accessing the 3D world via our 3D camera and then getting its globally accessible navigation map object. And so after we've resnapped our target position for the move, we'll use it to get positions for every selected unit using our line formation tool like before. Then, for each selected unit, we'll use the mapGetPath function to compute an array of vector 3 positions that analyzes the navigation map to nicely go from the current resnapped position of our unit to the right resnapped point in the formation. And we'll turn on the optimize ball flag, meaning that we'll get a smooth and as direct as possible trajectory. Finally, we'll pass this array of pre-computed positions to a unit, rather than the single target point we passed it in previous versions. So of course, this means that we also need to change some things in our unit script. In short, instead of storing a destination point, we'll store our path array. And in the process function, we'll just go for the first point in this array, as long as it's not empty, and when we reach it, we'll remove it from the array. This way, we'll iterate through all of our path milestones and basically do mini slide movements on each path segment until we've reached our final destination, at which point we'll stop our update loop like we did before. Also, this time we needed to look at the next point in the path every time we pop the milestone we reached so that our unit properly follows the orientation of the path. If you try our new system out, you'll see that our movement is looking better and better. Thanks to the nav map, our units now properly stay on the water and avoid islands on their way if need be before regrouping in a formation as instructed. And because we've resnapped all of our positions, they don't ever go or end up somewhere they shouldn't. As a mini bonus, if you want to give some feedback to the players and show them where exactly the units are heading, you can pop a little VFX to indicate the target position directly in-game. For example, here I prepared this little prefab scene with a simple plane and a custom shader on it. The shader looks like this, and in short, by playing around with the inner and outer radius properties, I can have my circle appear or disappear with a nice effect, and so in the animation player node, over here, I prepared a short show animation that uses those settings to create this cool animation. Then I put a super simple script on the root node of my move target prefab that contains a function to place the object somewhere on the map and trigger this show animation. This means that if I instantiate this prefab in my game scene, and then right-click on it to mark it as accessible via its unique name, just to make it quicker to get from my script, I can go back to the unit mover script and add these few lines of code to have the marker pop at the position of my right-click point in-game. And well, that's it! We've now got a basic RTS like unit's movement feature that properly handles the obstacles on the way, thanks to our navigation mesh, is still performant because there aren't any physics computations or collisions, uses a basic unit formation algorithm to ensure units don't overlap on the target position, and even has a little VFX to properly tell players where everyone's heading. Now, with that being said, there are of course a lot more nice features that make up an RTS game. So if you've got some ideas of mechanics that you'd like me to talk about, go ahead and leave a comment down below. And if you want to make sure that you don't miss any upcoming videos, subscribe to the channel. In the meantime, there are already a bunch of tutorials that you can discover. Of course, a huge thanks to my Patreon members for their support, and to you for watching. And as always, take care.